Vintuan is sometimes seen as the grandmother or grandfather of the Eco Village network. It's 53 years old almost and is probably one of the most, certainly in the West, one of the most fully functioning eco villages in terms of the five dimensions of sustainability that we build into the eco village concept. So it's pretty well established and I think it has quite a lot of kind of eldership to offer back to the eco village movement. It's one of the communities that probably holds the spiritual aspects strongest, not necessarily the strongest, but it's definitely at the heart of the Fintorn experiment is the wish to co-create a life that combines our spiritual essence, our human essence, and our co-creation with nature. So I think also the, the founding impulse that focus a lot on those three dimensions is very strong, very powerful. It's a potent archetypal idea, and it has manifested in a 53-year-old and still growing community. So I think it has a lot of weight, if you like, in the eco village movement as a, a kind of bastion of history and learning and solidity, in a way. It started off with three people, Peter and Eileen, Caddy and Dorothy McLean. They had a group together that they were meditating, and what they wanted to achieve was basically doing the will of God. Not their own personal will, but the will of God. Peter was um, hired as a as a hotel manager, Clooney Hill, which is a forest, it's close by, it's five miles from here. And with the three of them, they run the hotel. So they made a massive uh, success of the hotel, and the owner of the hotel asked them to do the same with another hotel that she owned in the Trossex. Um, they were very attached to Clooney, but the guidance was that they would come back. So they left with the three of them for the Trossex, and for some reason, it didn't turn out to be such a success that Clooney was and they were fired. So this is all they owned. They had a caravan and they had the car. Original caravan, this is where it all started. When they lived here, the guidance that Eileen received was this would become a place of pilgrimage that would attract thousands of people. And she would really laugh. She said, a caravan in the north of Scotland next to a dump. Why would people come here? And now we have like 5,000 residential guests on our programs and there are like thousands of people coming. So there was not a lot of money. Peter and Eileen had three children, three little boys and not a lot of money so they needed to grow their own food and um, Peter was the one that asked Dorothy whatever they learned in um, what, what the sense was in the meditation um, to do this with the plants and what they used which is really key in Findhorn is a tumen. So that's really woven into the fabric of this community attunement. And and it's all attunement is about inner alignment, inner listening, being present, releasing the past and not going into the future, but really being in the present, our physical body and expanding our awareness from there. People who come here tap into a field of of openness for that. We have several sanctuaries where people can just sit. We have the our daily rhythm is kind of embraced by by meditations in the early morning and then there's sacred singing and then there's another meditation and then we all start at nine o'clock after the meditation. So there is very much space for attunement and then when we begin our work we have a moment of attunement and and also when we complete our work, we dedicate and bless and send out what we have generated as a gift and a blessing. So, so when Dorothy sat with the pea plants, she really would get to know the pea plants. She would know how, what the growth was, how the leaf would look, how the roots would work. She almost became like a pea plant. When Dorothy made that connection with the nature world, and they really uh, made very good soil. The result was that they started to grow cabbages of 40 pounds, which is amazing because no, everybody knows that you cannot grow cabbages of 40 pounds or sand, basically, because that's what they were doing. So people 
first locally, people started to come and wanted to, because the word got spread around there, cabbages of 40 pounds. It's amazing, what's in? So, and then later, the circle got wider and everybody wanted to do it. And everybody wanted to learn how you can attune to, you can attune to a group, you can attune to a, a topic, but you can also attune to the nature world and work together with them. What I like about Fintorn that it has never been the intention to become a community. It just happened. I came to Fintorn originally 25 years ago. I was given a leaflet by my homeopath in London who said, I think you might like to go to this place. And I knew nothing about it. I just came up on a whim and had a life-changing experience on the Wednesday of my experience week here when I looked around the circle and we were 16 people and I felt that I had a connection to everybody there. I felt a sense of love and connection beyond the politics, the persona, the personality. And that was very life-changing for me. And I wrote in my journal that evening that life would never be the same. And I wanted to live, not necessarily in Fintorn, but I wanted to live in a place and in a way where I could continue to experience that sense of unconditional love, which sounds a bit corny, but it was really true for me. Vintorn came first to me in a very spontaneous, intuitive way. I've always been someone who, in a very unspooky way, hears a voice. It's my own inner voice, but I hear it as if it was outside of me. And when I went to live in Australia in 1993, I was in a school, teaching in a school, and somebody there was teaching people how to meditate, so I started to meditate. And I went deep into this meditative state in Sydney, and the word I heard was Vintorn. <laughs> And I just heard Findhorn, Findhorn. And afterwards, I used to compare it to somebody renting a boat on a village pond, and then a voice would say, come in, number nine, your time is up. And I honestly felt that the energy that was in Findhorn was calling me in. Uspensky has this, uh, has this saying that, um, that it is easier to escape from prison in a, in a group of prisoners than an individual prisoners. And, uh, you know, we're in the prison of our uh, psyches, as it were, and our, uh, our laws and our, the way we are. So in order to be able to wake it up uh, and move to a much more, if you like, uh, holistic, uh, awakened, uh, aware, whatever you like to call it, enlightened uh, way, then it is much easier doing it in what they call a sangha or in a group. So I was looking for a group uh, to join, and uh, Finhorn presented itself. Satisfaction is one thing, but it also brings to me a, a, great, a peace of mind. Before that, I would say I was very confused, aggressive, um, quite self-destructive. But this whole process, Findhorn and all everything else that's gone on, is sort of turning you into a far more loving, caring, creative human being. What is, what is special and also quite confusing for a lot of people, there is the Findhorn Foundation that is responsible for all the workshops that I said, and then there is the wider community that is the eco-village. And that has, um, there are different eco-villages from all over the world. And each eco-village have their own aims. And the one from, for Vindhorn is a combination of sp spirituality and sustainability. I mean, we're definitely not, if you like, uh, totally sustainable. In the, if you look at our, both our carbon footprint and our ecological footprint, uh, we're quite good, but we're not uh, at the sustainable level. We had our <clears throat> ecological footprint done with um, the Stockholm Institute um, some years ago and we came out at half the Scottish national average as an ecological footprint and actually um, one of the lowest um, numbers they had tested in the in the industrialized world. What we discovered as part of that process is that our two biggest sort of carbon expenditures are in heating um, uh, because we still use a lot of fossil fuels in heating uh, and also in travel, which uses fossil fuel. We managed to get a few electric cars, which is at least a start, um, as in our car sharing sort of organization here. We've also install, uh, installed uh, probably um, three or four biomass boilers, 
within the community that plans to do another four. And that will gradually eat into the, uh, to the amount of fossil fuels we're using for heating, because heating is 85% of our energy expenditure. I was uh, looking at the garden and also my house. Uh, I would say my garden is a net importer of waste. It's 100% waste. Uh, and my house is, well, I sometimes say 90% waste recycled. Uh, and of course that's a, a key permaculture principle, but also any ecological principle. It's, uh, th there should be no concept of waste. Waste is, uh, there's no such thing. The planet is designed to actually continually regenerate itself. Um, well, we have our own wastewater treatment plant here, which was built um, as the first of its kind in Europe uh, in 1995. It's a natural, so-called natural treatment system in that it uses ecological engineering, we call it, or engineered ecologies or biomimicry So, uh, in, in the processes. So we don't use chemicals, we add uh, some energy in the form of aeration. Um, but we let the uh, the we let the ecology mature, and it's actually the ecology itself that does the treatment. All the sewage from the whole site goes into on one end of the greenhouse, and it takes four and a half days to come out as grey water. There's a part of the garden that you create and you control, and there's another part that if you don't do that, you'll get a lot of wonderful surprises. Um, and of course then you might get some problems too but I feel all these problems that they're, they're, they're a, there's a solution in them in that they're energy that is actually embodied in the landscape and, it, and it's productive uh, but again the attitude is oh no that's a weed or oh, get rid of it uh, and for me a so-called weed which I don't have because uh, I think the weed concept is a a mental concept, <laughs> but the weed is a, is a plant waiting to be recognized uh, and it has a beneficial function. It's showing you that you're not doing something. The first wind turbine was actually built in 1979, so it's quite old um, and was one of the first, I think probably the first, wind, private wind turbine Islands. About six years ago we, in, we built another um, three wind turbines, so our total installed capacity is a nominal 750 kilowatts and we generate 1300 megawatts approximately each year of electrical power and we use about 1100 uh, megawatts, so we, we actually generate a surplus over the year, but of course um, some days we generate a good surplus and some days we're buying from the uh, national grid. And the EU Energy Management Grant is about maximizing the amount of uh, wind energy and solar energy that we can take so that uh, if we optimize that and buy less from the grid, then it's a lower carbon footprint, uh, which is good and also less expensive and um, is part of the overall philosophy or aim of the Finhorn Foundation to be carbon neutral um, eventually. And I, li I like the Finhorn thing. Uh, I mean, years ago, Peter Caddy said something like, uh, we've stopped growing vegetables and now we grow people. Um, but I actually like to grow the, uh, do both, grow people and, and vegetables at the same time. Once I really did, I really, really, really tried to control things and I had these specific uh, expectations and the more I've got to it is the more I give nature a chance uh, to express itself the more I get something that is completely unexpected there's a lot about beauty in the Findhorn Gardens but they use that it's usually very organized uh, and quite uh, well it's productive in the sense that it's beautiful but this type of gardening, I find, is it's beautiful in another wild way, but it's overtly productive. There's food everywhere. Uh, and half of the food, I would say, it's not for me. And I've always, from the permaculture perspective, the whole idea of fair share or future share, it's not just for me, it's not just for my kids or you. It's actually for the chickens who are somewhere wandering around the garden. 
and all those other creatures that actually want to come in. And I sometimes, from my aggressive Australian background, I say, you know, you're, you're a problem. Uh, and I go, actually, no, no, it's not. No, I'm the problem. I'm the problem. I've created this space and I expect them not to turn up when everything's laid on. I want to take it to that edge. I'm not trying to be self-sufficient, um, even though I think I could easily survive. I'd have to eat a lot of potatoes. Um, but I'm trying to actually show that we need to be more integrated into our habitat. But I do like, I like this area because again, it's unconventional. It's, uh, it's all these interesting roof shapes. This is all the whiskey barrel houses. And again, the whiskey barrel ha uh, barrels are all recycled. Uh, but it looks very futuristic. And in a crazy way it is. It's integrating it into the, uh, into the landscape just like a traditional village would be. Uh, and that's what I've always liked about traditional villages. They're somehow, they're not imposed on the landscape, they're actually placed in it. And they have an intimacy and what we call a human scale. And it changes completely the relationship of what the house is and how you live in it. And we're going to have to really change a lot of our ways. And I also feel that in some way the natural system will adjust us. You know, we're just a species, we're living in within something that is far bigger than what we know and species disappear all the time. Um, it would be sad that we, have, we seem to be so intelligent but we're actually almost chronologically uh, recording our demise. Um, but I have, I have hope that, that somewhere in the future there will be a record and it could, it could be a record in some form of thing that we've created, it could be a video, or there could be a record written into the geological layers saying, hey, this species at this particular time did a, an amazing turnaround and actually started working with nature instead of against it. Uh, and what does that say? Are we working against our own nature or we work, do we want to work with it?